So the final session on what's been a fascinating day that for The Economist began in Hong Kong uh, probably 16 hours ago now um, and went through London and, and now we're going to finish with some sport um, and really the question of he comes you know, which, down is, which like has puzzled me for a very long time of why is it but I'm getting the oh. snowstorm <laughs> not sure what happened there okay so the panel, um, which is really looking at whether we, why, why is sport being so slow in a way to uh, embrace LGBT inclusion and what can be done to change that? Uh, we have three really incredibly well-informed speakers. On the far end, Jason Collins, a retired NBA player. Um, next to him, Hudson Taylor, founder and chief executive of Athlete Ally and a you know, he's a highly recognized wrestler in his time. And uh, next to me, Catherine, Kathy Behrens, who's president for social responsibility and playing and player programs at NBA. And so, I mean, I really wanna, you know, so I, think, I think sport is such an interesting cultural phenomena to, to look at from, from all we've been talking about over the last you know, 16 hours or so, uh, because it does seem like it's been, you know, in some ways, Certain sports have, have been pioneers in this area. You think back to Rene Richards in tennis, transgender player back in the 70s, and, and, and yet it seems overall that it's been the last aspect, if you see sport as part of the entertainment industry, the last part of the entertainment industry to really uh, change and, and open up. And I, I wanted to ask Jason, I mean, you, you, you courageously came out I guess four years ago now, is it? Uh, three or four years uh, ago? Three years. I think it was yeah. three years ago. Three years ago. And really, probably the best known person in one of the major sports, professional sports, to have come out while still playing, at least. Well, why, is it so, why is it so hard? To, why has it been so hard to change sporting culture? Well, I just got to, there's a little caveat. Well, yes, I came out as a, but that's because of, society in general, being a, a man, uh, women have been doing this for decades. <laughs> right. So I have to give a lot of credit to some of my idols, Billie Jean King and Martina Navratilova uh, in tennis in particular, uh, who have come out and continue to play their sport. Um, when I was in the closet, <clears throat> I didn't feel comfortable acknowledging that, uh, especially Martina Navratilova is one of my sports idols. Mm. Um, because I didn't want people asking those questions, like why Martina, and then, but now that I'm out, I'm, <laughs> I get to tell the world how huge a fan and how much she impacted my life because she was um, from the sports world, sort of you know leading the march um, along with Billie Jean King, and then. And from what age did you know you were gay? I mean, you... Well, I knew in junior high school mm. um, that I had different feelings um, than the rest of my my teammates. And it took me some time to come to the point where I would be comfortable to say that I'm a gay man. Uh, gosh, just looking back on the, the, the experience, I reached a point in my private life where I told my, my parents, I told my, fam my, my family, my friends, and I was just ready to tell the rest of the world. I had the love and support. I was very fortunate that when I did come out that I had the love and support of my family. Um, those people that mean the absolute most to me. And I felt it was necessary that I was just tired of telling a lie. I, was, I just got to that point where I was just tired, mentally tired. And the culture of sport, especially in male contact sports, the worst thing that you can call uh, another competitor is, someone is, is soft. Um, you have to be aggressive, especially in contact sports. And there's this you know, stereotype out there about being uh, a, the gay athlete wouldn't be aggressive. Or, but then it takes you know, people like myself or you know, others come stepping forward to sort of you know, break that stereotype because you know, I led the NBA in fouls in one season. I was a hack out there. I was definitely one of the most physical uh, basketball players out there, but it takes people uh, stepping forward and the sort of playbook for um, male athletes was to wait a couple years after you're retired and then make an announcement but I didn't want to live in that world and 
Uh, a, a big step for me, a big push was when in 2013, I was playing for the Washington Wizards, living in Washington, DC, when Prop 8 and DOMA were being argued. And here I was, a professional athlete living less than three miles from the Supreme Court, and I couldn't speak up. I didn't have the, the voice to speak up. But uh, seeing um, other athletes, um, those straight allies like Hudson and uh, Brendan Ayambadejo and Chris Cluey um, speak up on, my, on the behalf of the LGBT community, it sort of gave me strength to finally step forward. And what reaction did you get you know, in, internally from other sports players? And was it what you expected? Or? <sighs> yeah, I didn't know what to expect. Um, but I sent, I uh, made calls. Um, I knew that the story was gonna come out on a Monday. So I made calls to some of my uh, friends and family and other people um, in the sports world. And I got overwhelmingly um, supportive. Um, Darren Williams, who's a, now a point guard with the uh, Dallas Mavericks, and Jerry Stackhouse, who's now retired, uh, former teammates of mine. They were just it, it, nothing but words of support. And those were the, sort of the first few calls that I made. So when I got that reaction, I was like, oh, this could be a really good thing. I didn't, uh, and then seeing Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash, and then um, I think Kathy can talk a little bit more from the uh, NBA side, uh, David Stern, the, our former commissioner, and uh, Adam Silver, some of their words. Um, they sort of helped me uh, feel comfortable to step forward because they started laying down the groundwork um, for inclusion and for acceptance um, when they started finding, uh, when David Stern fined Kobe Bryant $50,000 for using homophobic language, that was a signal to me that, okay, like if I were to come out, um, that the NBA would have my back, that they would create an atmosphere where I wouldn't be uh, subject to homophobic language. And does it, I mean, one of the points that was made in the very first session here t today by Kenji was that he basically feels that, you know, that, uh, there's a lot, because people can be invisible when they're LGB at least, uh, and maybe T as well, but LGB in particular, um, you know, once the cult, once the moment happens, the Ellen DeGeneres moment or whatever, you can see things flip very quickly and lots of people feel emboldened to come out of the closet. I mean, are you surprised that things haven't moved faster since you? It's a tough culture to change. There's, um, you know, each person obviously is, you know, living their own path, but it, it can be a very difficult decision to step forward because you know you're going to be in the, in the eye of the media. And uh, I got some great advice from John Amici. He's a mentor of mine, a former NBA basketball player. He came out a couple years after he retired um, and a couple years before I made my announcement. And he helped prepare me because before I made my announcement, I was always known as the good teammate, the pro's pro. Um, but he said that identity, you know, it's still going to be your identity, but a lot of people are, are going to now just call you the gay basketball player. And you have to be OK with that. You have to accept that. Um, and, and, and it's just sort of like every other thing that, you know, yes, I'm tall. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm black. Yes, I'm gay. And it's just you don't necessarily have to embrace everything, but you have to be able to, to live with uh, everything that gets thrown at you. And a lot of people aren't necessarily ready to. Uh, but if you had a lot of conversations with other athletes that are gay but yeah. haven't come out? Yeah, yeah, I'm in contact with. Uh, whether it be at the professional. A lot of it, though, is also a lot of uh, collegiate athletes. Um, younger generation is uh, having a lot easier time. And I think Hudson, we, we yeah, see we'll this talk, uh, with, with our talk, um, with our work that we do with the NBA, uh, with the younger generation, it's, it's a lot easier topic for them to talk about. Um, but some of the, the old, older <laughs> folks <laughs> so in the sports tell, tell world, a bit about, yes. A bit, bit about your background in case people don't know, but then you know, what, what, how does what Jason said relate to your, what you're seeing and particularly what we're seeing in the campuses now? Sure, so uh, my, my catalyst to doing all this work, uh, I was a, a wrestler in college and a theater major, so I was sort of in between two very different cultures, one in which I had teammates using homophobic and sexist language pretty regularly, and the other where I had uh, LGBT friends who were um, you know, valued and respected for, for who they were. And um, essentially how I got involved in doing this work, my senior year in college, I wore uh, an HRC sticker on my headgear to show support for the LGBT community. 
And in response to that, I got about 2,000 emails from closeted athletes who say, you know, I just read this article and uh, I'm going to try out for the wrestling team. I'm, I'm not afraid to go in the locker room. And um, that was a big moment for me, like, you know, sobbing, <laughs> reading these emails, but realize, like, if a wrestler could make that kind of an impact in a sport that people don't know or care a whole lot about, imagine if I had been a basketball player or a team or a league. And so um, my pathway to this work is really based on this belief that there's never been a successful social justice movement for a minority group without the support of the majority. That it, if we're going to change things in any sector of society, it cannot just be uh, the responsibility of those who are impacted by a form of prejudice who shoulder the responsibility of ending it. Um, I think in sports where we still have a major challenge, and that's kind of in structural, sport is one of the few institutions that is still segregated by gender. Right? From the moment that I step onto the wrestling mat, you know, we are divided on lines. Boys over here, girls over here. Sport teaches boys how to become men, girls how to become women. And I think because of that gender divide, I was taught that what is good is masculine and what is bad is feminine. And the way in which we express that is through the use of homophobic or sexist language. The easiest way that I can diminish the efforts of uh, one of my male teammates is to associate him with femininity. Um, on the flip side, the easiest way to put down a female athlete is to associate her with masculinity. And so I think um, that kind of forms the foundation of some of those... Well, there's a profound point challenge. in the sense that when you look at drug testing regimes and some of the situations with, you know, there's a South African runner that you know, seemed to be you know, not very clear gender-wise and there were tests that were quite intrusive that were being used. I mean, is that, do you think that sort of assertion of gender is... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's something that it, until we move beyond that, and how do we move beyond that in sport, that we, we're never going to really make the progress that you'd hope for? <laughs> well, I, I think so long, and this is a bigger conversation, but so long as we are um, rigid in our binary worldview, there's going to be challenges. Um, I think that the, the gender testing that continues to occur at the Olympic level uh, is a problem. I think that the institutions of sport try to masculinize male athletes and feminize female athletes. Um, we see that in, you know, just an example, gymnastics. Both men and women compete in floor. The women compete to music, the men do not. Something that has, you know, it's arbitrary. Um, when women's boxing was being introduced in the Olympics, it was proposed that they would wear uh, skirts. You know, again, something has no utility to the sport, and yet, <laughs> and yet these are the stories that we tell. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, that, that's a much harder challenge. But I do think that within the existing kind of structure, um, there are lots of teams and leagues and athletes who are uh, really working every single day to, to change the locker room culture and to use sort of the cultural capital of sports to advance LGBT equality more broadly. Now, Kathy, it's interesting. I mean, you're working for the NBA. And as I've watched this around the world, it seems like the, the professional businesses that are uh, you know, making a fortune you know, in what is a very highly branded consumer industry, they've been actually more, you know, wishing to, to actually produce LGBT athletes and stars than the stars themselves have been willing to come out because it's, you know, from a consumer marketing point of view, you can see all the attractions and they've been quicker to crack down on homophobic and unacceptable behavior. And, and, and I, I sort of sense, why is it, I'm interested in your perspective, why do you find it so difficult to get a change in the culture on, on the, in, the, in, the, in the locker rooms and yeah. let, on, let, on the let, pitch when you've, you know, clearly there's, your consumer base wants this to happen. Yeah. Well, let me just say that I'm not sure, I, I, I don't think it, people are supportive of LGBT rights because they think it's a good marketing ploy. Um, at least I hope not. Certainly it's not something that, that we think about. Um, but change is hard. But you certainly think that your, I mean, your audience now wants this, doesn't it? Or a significant part of your I don't know. You know, in 2000, the times have changed a little bit. But you know, what Jason was talking about before the the NBA reaction in 2011, we did a, a PSA campaign with Glisten about the use of homophobic slurs in sport and uh, used some of our players to speak out on that. And Glisten is a just a fantastic partner, and we've done a lot of stuff with them since. But <clears throat> um, we did the campaign very quickly because um, it just was one of those things that came together and we felt like the moment was right. And uh, the campaign um, was, we aired it for the first time, I think, during the, the conference finals 
that season. And during the NBA Finals, a few weeks later, we had uh, protesters out at uh, American Airlines Arena in Dallas um, protesting the commissioner for doing the campaign. And um, so, you know, so what? I mean, we were like, see ya. Uh, <laughs> hope you like the spot. We're going to run it again uh, during the game. And um, so you just either have to do it or not do it. I think if you try to say, oh, this is a marketing ploy, this is a good idea because, you know, maybe more people will buy something or come to a game. It's like you have to either believe it, know that you have a platform to help push this movement um, forward, that you have to support um, your, your athletes and your, and your employees, or, or you don't, or you learn and you evolve, and hopefully we'll all continue to push it. I suppose it. the point I'm making is you, you as organizations, I think, are running ahead of where your players are, and you, you must have knowledge of players that, you know, would like, you know, are, that are LGBT but don't feel ready to come out yet. That's okay. The, we'll, we support them whether they're ready to come out. No, but, how do you, but what I'm asking ask is how do you create, given there is evident willingness from the authorities, how do you actually, what do you do to try and change this environment? You know, you use, you use folks like Jason and Hudson who helps us in, in a lot of these ways. We have athletes um, in the WNBA. Uh, we have a referee who just recently uh, publicly came out. Um, so you, you create an environment that is supportive, that demonstrates um, that the, the culture is open and accepting and um, encouraging and, and wants everyone to bring their true self to work, whether you're working in the, on the business side or whether you're an athlete. And, and our, our job as the league is to make sure that we create that environment and that people know that that's what the environment is so that they're comfortable and that when we do have occasions where people say <coughs> stupid things, uh, that there are consequences to that behavior. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, I was just going to say, like, one of the challenges in professional sports in general, so the NBA, the average career of an NBA player is like three and a half years, right? So if your livelihood is contingent upon your ability to get a contract, sponsorships, continue to play, um, there's a huge risk involved. And so I think part of our challenge is how do we make it clear to athletes who are LGBT that the uh, risk does not outweigh that reward? And I think that's through the, you know, when an athlete uses homo anti-LGBT language, there's a consequence. I think that's, um, the NBA has been pretty uh, proactive on the trainings of educating their players and their front office folks. Um, so I think it's, it's sort of that both proactive and reactive, right? We need to have the policies and the trainings uh, to kind of state the principles and values that we believe in, but we also need consequences when those things uh, fall apart. Now, Jason, I mean, when, you're, when you were thinking about all your sponsorship deals and all those sorts of things and the people who were advising you around that, I mean, did it, was this something that you, you thought this might yeah. put Nike off or I, might put whoever? Yeah, and I, I applaud what Nike recently did with Manny Pacquiao, mm. uh, who made some very uh, homophobic and crazy <laughs> comments uh, recently. Um, but he wasn't in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's going into politics, so I guess. <laughs> well, crazy comments no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the Philippines. <laughs> but, um, it's, um, so when you see a company like Nike, um, you know, immediately terminate their relationship with him, that that makes as an LGBT athlete it makes me so proud that I still do have my relationship with Nike, and I see other athletes, um, Gus Kenworthy, the skier that just came out. Um, he has a new line of goggles that he just <laughs> put up on social media. So it's really cool to see um, Nike, uh, and they have like a separate line called Be True, the Be True line, which uh, gives money, uh, parts uh, of the proceeds go back to the LGBT uh, community. It's really cool when I see companies like that, and I've walked in Portland Pride with Mark Parker, the CEO. And but was that something that advisors, do you think advisors to players are typically saying, you know, just get, think, stay away from this. Well, I think everybody, when we talk, I heard, you know, risk being risk averse. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes the, uh, your agents might not um, you know, tell you to, okay, sort of, you know, play middle of the road. Um, but as at the year, an individual, and you have to try to live your authentic life. Um, because when you're not, 
the, the stress that comes just being a professional athlete, but then the stress of trying to hide who you are, it, it, it just weighs on you. And I think that was um, you know, part of the reason why I came out to eliminate that stress. And uh, I felt <laughs> a million times better, exponentially better. And um, agents now need to know that there are those um, companies like Nike, and I know Hudson was talking in the back about Adidas now, um, that are ready to support LGBT athletes. Now, as you've talked to people who are not yet out, what's your sense of the, the is there some ch single thing that could change that, if it changed, would make them more willing to, to do so? <laughs> Continuing to see um, signals, um, whether it be from the league, sports leagues, or to see signals like from uh, companies like Nike um, that are letting them know that it's okay, that if you do come out, it'll be okay. Um, I'm so proud of uh, Derek Gordon, plays for Seton Hall, um, who's the uh, first openly gay male Division I basketball player, and um, they just had a big win last, <laughs> last weekend. Um, but it's, it's examples uh, like him and then every athlete coming forward and telling their story. Um, I think that's the most powerful way to create change is by you know, individuals like myself or Brittany Griner or Robbie Rogers or Gus just coming out telling our story um, because it might have an impact on somebody that we might not ever meet but will keep the ball moving forward to use a, a yeah. Kathy, I mean, one of the previous panels on marketing uh, that uh, Peter from Giovanni was saying that they were sponsors of the US Olympic team and during the Winter Olympics where Putin had made uh, you know, clear that um, you know, he was very hostile to LGBT uh, messaging at all from any of the athletes. Um, and Giovanni had made a very clear public statement of disapproval of that, but some of the other sponsors, as he put it, had their lawyers write their, <laughs> their statements. Now, I mean, do you feel that the main sponsors, and I guess we're going to have this issue if the World Cup still, Soccer World Cup still happens in Qatar, I mean, that's going to be a real testing point in a few years' time, given the hostility there. But I mean, do you think sponsors, the big sponsors, are now on board and supportive, or do you feel they could be doing more to help I, change I the conditions? <clears throat> I think we can all do more. Um, you know, we're not, when you still have situations where people are discriminated against, then we all have an obligation to speak out. And to me, it's not just the notion that, you know, the, the companies have an obligation to do it. I think we all have an obligation. Um, and so, uh, the platform that I think what's unique for for the sports world and and we've seen it because we live it every day is you know we 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 sports plays an outsized role in society and we have an obligation I think to use that platform to make sure that we're um, addressing issues that are important to our communities and important to the people in our communities and also if there is um, if there is injustice in this space, you have to speak out against it. And that's something that, w that we try to do, not perfectly, but try to do it. And, and so I don't, I don't think we should all wait and sit back, wait for you know, McDonald's or another company, whoever we were talking about before, to, to, to sort of take the lead on something. It, the people have to push the movement. I think, and, and I think that's happened. And I think thanks to the, a lot of the leaders in this room and, and others, um, you know, progress is is happening, and it's but it's got to be faster and um, and more widespread, certainly globally, um, and we've got to just keep pushing. Hudson. Yeah. So uh, I have a lot of thoughts about this. Mm. Um, so let uh, just a, a, an example of how I think about these things from the uh, on the Olympic side. So obviously in Sochi we had this anti-gay propaganda law. We had this. The, the Olympic Games going, which from a value standpoint should represent equality and these principles of inclusion. <clears throat> um, whenever, from athlete ally standpoint, whenever we're organizing, we're always looking at answering two questions. Why and what, right? So whatever community in which we're working, why should you care and what am I asking you to do? So when, uh, there's a great book you should all read, it's called The Honor Code. It talks about how moral revolutions happen. And essentially what that book says is that the way that we change a culture is not by telling people what is right and wrong, but instead by redefining the dominant identity of our audience. 
So when we looked at, at Sochi and the, the opportunities there, the challenges there, we said, okay, well, what is the dominant identity of the Olympic movement? Okay, well, we look at the Olympic Charter. Uh, principle six of the Olympic Charter says that discrimination of any kind is incompatible with belonging to the Olympic movement. Those are, are values that pretty much speak out against Russia's anti-gay propaganda law. Um, so we ran a campaign. We got American Apparel to come on board, and make T-shirts, bags. We donated the proceeds back to LGBT Russian organizations. Um, you know, it, it essentially was a campaign acknowledging IOC's responsibility to create a safe experience for the athletes and the fans. As a result, uh, the IOC changed Principle Six to include sexual orientation. Um, Kazakhstan was one of two countries bidding for the 2022 games, and they also were cont contemplating an anti-gay propaganda law. Um, but because the IOC had passed you know, this inclusive language of Principle Six, Kazakhstan had to be accountable if they wanted to host the games. So we organized an open letter with athletes like Jason and others saying, hey, if Kazakhstan hosts the game, they can't have this law. President Bach writes a letter in response saying, yes, that's true. Three days later, Kazakhstan kills that legislation. So I think that when we look at sport and the, from a global standpoint, right, in 76 countries plus or whatever, you can be fined, arrested, or put to death for being LGBT. Sport is one of the few institutions that cuts across country, cuts across race, religion. You know, there will always be a spectrum of opinion on any social justice issue, but our fans of sports fans are, I think, more often than not, those, that demographic that we need to reach the most. Um, so I'm very interested in you know, what, from a corporate standpoint, can we do in the bidding process so that we're awarding championships to cities and states and countries that are deserving of the honor. Um, if and where are we with the Super Bowl on that? Is that now <laughs> happening or not? Uh, well, you know, I, I, think, I think it's always difficult to change uh, a venue once it's been established. There's so much at stake, but what we can do is be a little bit more forceful with um, you know, where, where a championship is going. I think that we've seen in this country, RIFRA, the RIFRA laws have been um, successfully combated in some instances because of sports. Like in Arizona, 1062 was, you know, the NBA made a statement, MLB made a statement, Super Bowl committee made a statement, and as a result, uh, Jan Brewer vetoed the bill. And I think that we need sort of similar thinking in, um, in from an LGBT landscape. I mean. Stadiums are places of public accommodation. So if you're a company who has naming rights to a stadium, like you should be speaking out about these public accommodations bills to make sure that you are supporting them because LGBT fans go to, stadium, go to, go to sporting events. So I think there are lots of ways in which we can think creatively about how sport can play a instrumental role in changing policy and I think in saving people's lives. I don't know, have you looked at FIFA and the new rules they brought in, are they uh, I was in Zurich last week yeah. uh, pushing some FIFA reforms. Um, I think that's an uphill battle. Um, <laughs> we were primarily working to uh, push FIFA on increasing the role of women in FIFA governance, uh, which they've done a little bit, but there's still quite a bit more to do. Um, so the fact there's change of leadership doesn't mean big changes necessarily? You need more women in no. order to get real change. So that's what we're working on. <laughs> so let's uh, throw it over to the audience. Anyone want to jump in? You can ask for sporting predictions from Jason as well, if you like. <laughs> yeah. Anyone want to have the first question? Right at the back there, lady. Please, please say who you are as well. My name is Lisa Kanz. I'm with Gallagher Consulting uh, and a former Division One female athlete, basketball at Villanova. And I, um, I strongly understand the dynamics of sports, particularly for young women in sports. Um, a lot of the issues that describe, particularly in basketball, it's the opposite in women's basketball. And I think a lot of it stems from youth and the perception that sports are for boys. Are any of the programs that you're talking about starting to drill down into youth sports? And the idea that if you're good at something, it's not because you're good at something, it's because you play like a boy. Um, and that in itself, that socialization of sports and being good and it, the focus not being on the skills, but on the attributes that are manly or womanly, I think there's a, a deep um, it, social impact when it comes to sports and it puts that at odds for athletes 
more so than any other, it, it's, the focus should be on this, the talent. So what, what programs might be out there or what are you considering or contemplating to, to help people focus on skills rather than social attributes? We'll come back to you for your reaction because I'm interested from what you did, your own experience, whether you find the answers eliminating. Uh, okay. We would like to react to that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, so we have a, um, a, a youth basketball initiative that we do for, for boys and girls that's designed to not only teach the fundamentals and improve the skill development um, for boys and girls who are playing basketball, uh, but also to talk about the values that we think are, are important to building a great teammate. And Hudson actually is, is going to be working with us to make sure that we start talking to younger kids about some of those values of respect and um, character, um, all of the things that we think are, are the, the true things you learn from being a part of a team. Um, we we want to really make sure are, are part of our conversation with kids who are playing the game of basketball, boys and girls, at a very early age. Now, it's not... It's not it. You can't just rely on that. You obviously, you know, I think that's why programs like the programs that Glisten runs in schools are so incredibly important. Uh, but there's a lot to do. One of the one of the reasons why we worked with Glisten was because so much of uh, so much of of bullying happens in locker rooms and and on playgrounds and and around sports. And it just it's it just. It's so wrong because sports are really, I think, an opportunity to bring people together. And the platform that we have to try to help change that discussion and change that conversation and have some impact at the youngest ages is something we have to do more on. And that's, that's really why we're, we're talking about it. We obviously have a huge benefit because the WNBA, which is celebrating its 20th season this year, um, can, is such a platform as well, not just for uh, people who love the game of basketball, but for girls to aspire and be inspired by the women of the WNBA. Um, and so we really want to make sure that people understand what that value is um, that, that comes from, from, from our sport, uh, both for men and women. Yeah. yeah, I would just say, you know, from my standpoint, um, I, so Athlete Ally, we're, a lot of our framing and philosophy is coming from an ally standpoint. And I think one of the things that um, sometimes gets overlooked is that allyship needs to be intersectional. Um, I'm a big believer that homophobia is a weapon of sexism and that the reason why somebody uses a homophobic slur is because of narrow definitions of masculinity and femininity. And so um, I think if we're going to break the cycle, um, we need to think about these things intersectionally. I, I'm a big believer that we need more men to be better allies to women. I think that, um, again, those mixed gendered sporting opportunities, I think, are crucial. When Monet Davis strikes out a boy, you throw like a girl is no longer an insult. Um, so I think until we create more sporting experiences and opportunities to um, just break down that, stereo that entrenched idea that, that women in sports are not as powerful and successful and badass, um, you know, I, I think we're, not gonna, we're gonna be having this conversation 50 years from now about LGBT and everything else. So I, I just think all of our efforts need to think about how we, we combat um, all the for forms of oppression and discrimination, not just the LGBT ones. Jason, anything to add? I mean, how do I follow that? <laughs> no, I just, I go around trying to support uh, a lot of different groups. I've worked with Junior NBA and um, just talking to kids. For me, it always goes back to um, having those conversations with the, the kids and trying to tell them that um, sports is about inclusion and that the team is made stronger uh, when everyone feels comfortable uh, to be their true self. Do you know, just a reaction, I mean, what would have helped in your uh, college athlete days? I think Hudson's comment about the intersection of sexism and, and the stigma around LGBT is, is definitely what it's about. Because um, the comments would be, well, you don't look like a female athlete. What does that mean, I don't look like a female athlete? I just, I have a scholarship, I played basketball. It's, it's the stigma around what it's like to be feminine versus masculine and not enough focus on the skills that it takes to, for, and the dedication, the commitment to a sport, and that it's okay to be however you are. You're talented. That's what the focus should be when you're an athlete. And I think that, that emphasis, um, starting at a very early age and, and as 
there, there should be some training and support for students, anyone involved in sport, if you're gonna coach a sport, if you're gonna parent a sport, if you're gonna referee in a sport. I think all of those things are very important, not just you don't yell at a ref, you're, <coughs> you're a good sportsman or sportswoman. It's about everything that it means to be involved in, in athletics. And I think that should be the focus. So Hudson's comments were right on. Great, lady down the front here. Hi, my name is Patty McGarvey Nevels, and I'm a civil rights attorney. And first of all, I just want to commend you all for your courage and for speaking out so honestly and openly. And I'm really empowered and feel grateful to be at this conference because I'm a government attorney. And <coughs> honestly, to get to this conference is kind of amazing. <coughs> but I think to follow up on the last comment, um, and I think Hudson, what you said is stereotyping of men and women is pervasive, <coughs> and you get it from right out of the womb. And um, two documentaries I would commend to you is one called Misrepresentation, which is out on Netflix. The other <coughs> one I believe is just out, which I saw about masculinity and very profound, the mask you live in. And I really would commend to you to look at those. The, the second one, The Mask You Live In, talks about masculinity. And a former NFL player and coach says the three worst words you can say to a little boy is be a man. And it goes on to have really scary statistics about what we do to our male youth. And while I think that this can be applied to females, males, I mean, can't we just call human beings, really. But the bottom line is we are programmed that way and that anyone would be fearful about being who we are, we got to get at the young level. So any of you who are parents, coaches, anybody, um, and I particularly appreciate the athletes and those in sports because I have a 19-year-old son. It's all about sports. I mean, you have such a powerful platform. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Did we take any, another couple of questions? Is there any out there? Was there someone at the back? And just while we go yeah. to that other question. Oh, a lady over there. I want to say from another a, lady over there. So from a masculinity and femininity standpoint, I think it's also really important for our transgender uh, athletes, you know, colleagues. Um, you know, the, the, the transphobia is also rooted in how we identify masculinity and femininity. So I think that's another component of this that we have to acknowledge and talk about. But, but I think you also have to acknowledge that, <clears throat> I mean, you could listen to some of the comments that Brittany Griner, when you, when you listen to what, what Brittany talks about and shares when she was playing, particularly when she was playing in college, the things that people would say to her or the things that people say to her when she's just out and about, um, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's disgusting. And so the language has to change both on the notion of girls and boys, but also, you know, the, how we talk about um, athletes and, and how we talk about um, LGBT people in general, whether or not you have a platform to, to speak out against it. Um, I mean, Brittany's story is, is really remarkable, and I think it's, it's worth, that sort of is another good lesson for young kids, because I think that's something that we forget and, and, and think only about you know, the, the women who have forged the path here, um, you know, deserve a lot more credit than they get uh, in this space, uh, especially on the athlete side. And I know Jason has acknowledged that, but it's, it's, it's something that we wrestle with too in, in terms of, of the WNBA and the, um, and the focus that we want on the skills, um, but also on the stories of these women. Right, so lady in the middle there. Hi, I'm Carol Watson from Diversity Best Practices. I've heard you speak a few times, Jason. Thank you for sharing your story. I wanted to um, get learn from you. The C there was a CEO earlier that talked about uh, as a recently coming out CEO, how his productivity and his work style changed when he came out. I wanted to know what you noticed, what you were surprised about, about your play, both technically, productivity. What did you notice about how your play changed? You talked about how it was a major weight lifted <coughs> off of you. Uh, um, well, first I wanted to talk about just my interaction in the locker room. Uh, I was just way more relaxed. I was able to enjoy my teammates, and my teammates 
uh, we, we had fun. We just had a lot of fun together with the Brooklyn Nets. Um, a lot of maturity. Was there a lot of banter about you having come out? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, but it was all good stuff. It was all like, oh, wow, Oprah. Oh, wow, the president. <laughs> like, <laughs> funny, like, just, but good, like, because, like, the, going into a locker room, uh, I've talked about in this past, it's sort of like going into uh, a comedy club and it's open mic night and everybody likes to, you know, <laughs> razz each other and talk about, oh, look at those shoes and just, whoa, whoa, you know, whoa, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> They're, they're very nice, Thanks. but uh, <laughs> so it's the socks. Yeah, it's the whoa. socks. It's the pop of color. It's Sorry. the pop of color. But it's little stuff like that. The, inter the the human interaction. I was much more open to interacting with my with my teammates. And then on the court, my performance. I I, I don't know. I just felt like I um, I didn't have that stress. I, like the, my, my only stress was okay, who am I going up against tonight, and how am I going to make um, the opposing center, um, you know, regret that he's on the court with me, kind of thing. Uh, when you cross the lines on a on a sporting field, you have to, especially in the contact, you have to be tough. You you have to go out there and play with a lot of uh, aggression, and um, but at the same time, I was free, and um, also it impacted my brother. My brother became a huge uh, ally, and. Uh, Any time that and now he's a coach with the Golden State Warriors, and any, he's like another you know set of eyes and ears, and another person that's speaking up for the LGBT community. I'm very proud uh, of everything that he's done uh, as far as being an ally uh, and advocate for the community. We're nearly out of time. So one last comment there. Um, my name is Stephanie Durand. I work at Coursera, which is an online education platform. Um, I also grew up playing a lot of tennis. I was at national level in France, and I relate to, you know, the stereotyping. I always felt like I was being masculine by being a tennis player, by doing a lot of sports. Um, frankly, I'm amazed with the courage that you have and the role model that you play. And getting back to Hudson's comment on the 76 countries where it's either illegal or you can even be threatened to death to be LGBT, how do you view your role model play internationally and being amplified? Because frankly, outside of the US, I don't know many athletes that are out, uh, even in my country or in Europe in general. And so I'd be curious to hear about what you think could be done to really uh, amplify your role model at a, at a global level. Now that I uh, do some work with the NBA, uh, partnered with the uh, State Department, uh, I've gone on a couple trips, a sports envoy trip recently uh, to Rio, and we went around to uh, do different you know, clinics with kids, but then we also spoke at a university um, about diversity, inclusion, acceptance, trying to change uh, the culture of sport um, with regards to um, the Brazilian national team and um, again, it's going to different countries, whether it's me or it's Martina Navratilova, or, but just sharing our story. And so someone in the room might connect with something that we said, might have a shared experience, and then, um, case in point, I was in Toronto recently, I don't even know if I told you this, but um, one of the owners um, of one of the teams came up to me and said that his son just came out to him. Mm -hmm. And just having that conversation, like I, 20 years ago, that conversation wouldn't have happened, but um, just recently, and then sort of being able to have a long talk about, okay, this is what you can expect, and just having those conversations in the world of sports um, you know, starts to change the culture. Great, well, we're pretty much out of time. I just wanted to end by asking each of you, you have an audience here that came partly because the agenda is the business you know, case for LGBT inclusion. I wonder if each of you has a challenge for people in, their, in the business world as to what they could do to help with regard to sport. I, uh, I guess I'll go quickly. <laughs> um, just continue to put out those signals. When I was a closeted athlete and when I saw the signals from the leadership of the NBA um, trying to change the culture of sport and say homophobic language will not be, when I entered the NBA in 2001, you could use certain terms. Nowadays, that's a minimum $50,000 fine. Um, so seeing that sparks, you know, that employee, uh, when they see the leadership um, put out those signals of acceptance and what is and isn't gonna be tolerated, uh, the culture 
of your workplace. Try to continue to make that culture one of acceptance. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, all right, one ask, what do we got? <laughs> uh, so I would say that context matters and that when we look at, so I'm, I'm very interested from a, from a policy standpoint, how can business help advance LGBT equality from a legislative standpoint? And when I think about it, like Georgia, okay, right now there's a lot of bad laws that are being debated in Georgia. Uh, golf championship happens in Georgia. If any of you have contacts with golfers, get them to say a positive statement, that could change the dialogue. If you have any, you know, if, again, if any of you companies have naming rights on a, on a stadium in a city or a state that's deba debating uh, anti-LGBT legislation, that's an opportunity. So I, I, I want you to think about the context of all of this, because if we agree with the basic premise that sport has the power to change people's hearts and minds in a unique way, then the barrier of what we need people to say or do is pretty damn low, right? If, I, if we just get one athlete to say, hey, I would love to play with an openly gay athlete in a city that, like Houston, when they were debating the Equal Rights Ordinance, that could have made all the difference in the world. So I just challenge you to think about um, the relationships you have in sport and how they can be leveraged to promote LGBT equality, both here in the US and around the world. And last word to you, Kathy. You know, I would just say that we, we all have an obligation and we have to keep pushing. Progress doesn't happen overnight and we can't ever be satisfied until more progress is made. Well, I'm gonna hand over now to Tom Standage to do some concluding remarks, but I'd like to thank the three of you for a really inspiring panel. Thank you.